In this presentation, we are going to take a look at chapters 7 through 9 in the Book of Mormon, Mormon's book that he now writes during his day. Mormon abridged the large plates, but then he also wrote a book himself. And so this is Mormon chapter 7 through 9. Mormon 7 through 9, here's an introduction. By studying the final testimony of Mormon and the initial writings of Moroni, you will better understand the role and purpose of the Book of Mormon. Moroni declared, I speak unto you as if you were present, and ye are not, but behold, Jesus Christ hath shown you unto me, and I know your doings. Moroni's prophetic vantage point allowed him to complete the Nephite record with total awareness of both the escalating wickedness and the great spiritual blessings of the dispensation of the fullness of times. In a day when some people might be inclined to abandon faith in the face of great difficulties, Moroni's words teach us to see miracles and revelations as evidence that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Although the spiritual and social conditions in the world may be in a state of constant change and decline, God's covenant people can have full confidence that He is eternally the same. Brothers and sisters, God is in complete control. Everything is going according to plan down here. God knows what He is doing. Let's go now to Mormon chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 11, the phrase would speak somewhat unto the remnant of this people who are spared. In his final words, Mormon addressed the descendants of the Lamanites and affirmed that they are a remnant of the house of Israel. Even though the Lamanites were his mortal enemies, his love for them demonstrated his spiritual maturity and the importance of the full blessings of the gospel. Consider Mormon's final testimony and counsel as if he were speaking directly to you. He taught what you need to know and what you need to do in order to follow the example of the Savior so that it shall be well with you in the day of judgment. Chapter 7, verses 2 and 5, Ye are the house of Israel. Mormon's message to the remnant of the Lamanites also applies to all members of the house of Israel. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles reflected on Moroni's poignant plea to those of the latter days to believe in Christ. In a soliloquy of death, Mormon reached across time and space to all, especially to the remnant of the house of Israel, who would one day read his messianic message, or messianic majestic record. Those of another time and place must learn what those lying before him had forgotten, that all must believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, that following his crucifixion in Jerusalem, he had, by the power of the Father, risen again, whereby he, ha whereby he hath gained the victory over the grave, and also in him is the sting of death swallowed up. I'm sorry, the first one was seven, chapter 7, verse 1. Not 11, 7, verse 1 was the first one. To believe in Christ, especially when measured against such tragic but unavoidable consequences, was Mormon's last plea and his only hope. It is the ultimate purpose of the entire book that would come to the latter-day world, bearing his name. Chapter 7, verse 4. Know ye that ye must lay down your weapons of war? War is never the solution to men's problems. Though it may be necessary to protect one's family and rights, its side effects and after effects are devastating. The saints are called to renounce war and proclaim peace, even the peace that can come only through gospel living. President Spencer W. Kimball wrote of the buildup of military might as a form of national and international idolatry. Quote, in spite of our delight in defending ourselves as modern and our tendency to think we possess a, a sophistication that no people in the past ever had, in spite of these things, we are on the whole an idolatrous people, a condition most repugnant to the Lord. We are warlike people, easily distracted from our assignment of preparing for the coming of the Lord. When enemies rise up, we commit vast resources to the fabrication of gods of stone and steel ships, planes, missiles, fortifications, and depend on them for protection and deliverance. When threatened, we become anti-enemy instead of pro-kingdom of God. 
We train a man the art of war and call him a patriot, thus in the manner of Satan's counterfeit of true patriotism, perverting the Savior's teachings. What are we to fear when the Lord is with us? Can we not take the Lord at his word and exercise a particle of faith in him? Our assignment is affirmative, to forsake the things of the world as ends in, them, in themselves, to leave off idolatry and press forward in faith, to carry the gospel to our enemies, that they may no longer be our enemies. We must leave off the worship of modern-day idols and reliance on the arm of flesh, for the Lord has said to all the world in our day, I will not spare any that remain in Babylon. End of quote. Chapter 7, verse 7, He that is found guiltless before him at the judgment day. Men and women can never be guiltless as a result of their own deeds. All of us sin. All offend the Spirit. All experience spiritual death. It is through the atonement of our Lord and Savior, as a result of their trust in His mercy and grace, that people are made clean, are justified, certified to be innocent, exonerated, declared righteous, pronounced guiltless. Chapter 7, verse 7, the phrase, hath it, not, hath it not given unto him to dwell in the presence of God? Salvation, which is exaltation, which is eternal life, is free. It is not something for which we can barter, nor something which may be purchased with money. Nor in the strictest sense is it something which we may, may, that which may be earned. More correctly, salvation is a gift. A gift most precious, something gloriously transcendent, which may only be inherited. Chapter 7, verses 8 through 9. The Book of Mormon and the Bible support each other. The Bible testifies to the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon testifies to the Bible, declared this, the Book of Mormon, is written for the intent that ye may believe that, the Bible, and if you believe that, the Bible, you will also believe this, the Book of Mormon, also. That is a true sign of a true Christian, a true Christian that truly believes in all of the Bible when presented with the Book of Mormon will also believe in the Book of Mormon. President Brigham Young declared it impossible for someone who claimed to truly believe in the Bible to not believe in the Book of Mormon if they had seriously studied the Book of Mormon and learned its doctrines. Quote, no man can say that this book, laying his hand on the Bible, is true, is the word of God, is the way, is the guide, broad in the path, and a charter by which we may learn the will of God, and at the same time say the Book of Mormon is untrue. If he has had the privilege of reading it, or of hearing it read, and learn it, uh, learning its doctrines, there is not that person on the face of the earth who has had the privilege of learning of the gospel of Jesus Christ from these two books who can say that one is true and the other is false. End of quote. One purpose of the Book of Mormon is to prove to the world that the Holy Bible is true. By reading the Book of Mormon, a person's testimony of the Bible increases. President Ezra Taft Benson spoke of his love for the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and how both testify of Jesus Christ. Quote, I love the Bible, both the Old and New Testament. It is a source of great truth. That sacred and holy book has been of inestimable worth to the children of men. In fact, it was a passage from the Bible that inspired the prophet Joseph Smith to go to a grove of trees near his home and kneel in prayer. What followed was the glorious vision that commenced the restoration of the fullness of the gospel to the earth. That vision also began the process of bringing forth new scripture, the Book of Mormon, to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Bible and bearing witness to a wicked world that Jesus is the Christ and that God lives and loves his children and is still intimately involved in their salvation and exaltation. End of quote. Nephi wrote, And now, my beloved brethren, and also Jew, and all ye ends of the earth. Hearken unto these words, and believe in Christ. And if you believe not in the, these words, believe in Christ. And if ye shall believe in Christ, you will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ. And he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. That is to say, a good Christian, one who is open to the revelation of the Spirit, one who loves the Lord and seeks earnestly to know his mind and will will recognize and acknowledge the spirit which illuminates the pages of the Book of Mormon to be the spirit of God, the same spirit which breathes life and meaning into the pages of the Bible. 
Let's now turn our attention to Mormon chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, Moroni. Moroni witnessed the death of his father, Mormon, and the destruction of the entire Nephite nation. Nevertheless, his life was preserved, and he faithfully filled his mission, fulfilled his mission in mortality. The Lord appointed Moroni to finish writing the sad tale of the destruction of the Nephites. Before his death, Moroni wrote the last part of his father's book, Mormon 8-9. through a bridge to Jaredite record, the Book of Ether, recorded the vision of the brother of Jared in a still portion of the plates, and also wrote his own book, the Book of Moroni. Yet, Moroni's mission continues in our dispensation. In modern revelation, we learn that Moroni holds the key of the record of the stick of Ephraim. The resurrection Moroni ministered to the prophet Joseph Smith and tutored him several times on his role in restoring the fullness of the gospel, including the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Depicting Moroni's role in the restoration, the church has placed statues of Moroni atop most of its temples. Mormon 8, 1 through 6 reveals the circumstances under which Moroni lived and helps readers understand the urgency of his message. Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles counsels us to put ourselves in the position of those who wrote the scriptures long ago. Quoting Brigham Young, Elder Perry said, quote, Do you read the scriptures, my brothers and sisters, as though you were writing them a thousand or two thousand or five thousand years ago? Do you read them as though you stood in the place of the men who wrote them? If you do not feel thus, it is your privilege to do so, that you may be as familiar with the spirit and meaning of the written word of God as you are with your daily walk and conversation. End of quote. Let us take Brigham Young's advice and imagine we are standing in the place where Moroni, the last of the great Nephite prophets, stood. The assignment his father gave him to complete the record, which was entrusted to his care, was very difficult. He must have been in a state of shock as he described the total destruction of his people. He must have felt compelled to describe how his people had been hunted by the Lamanites until they were all destroyed. In his feeling of loneliness, he reports that his father was among those who were killed. We sense that the only thing Moroni is living for is to complete the record he writes. Therefore I will write and hide up the record in the earth, and whether I go, it mattereth not. All he has is the faith that the Lord will preserve him long enough to complete the record and that some day it will be found by one chosen of the Lord. He realizes that the record will be a voice of warning to future generations of what occurs when nations like his own turn away from the teachings of the Lord. It is from the depths of his heart that Moroni cries out to those who will eventually receive the record. He wants to spare those who read his account the heartache and misery which comes from disobedience. He writes first to the members of the church and then to those who have not embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. Moroni's last words to the members of the church are written as a voice of warning. He writes as one who sees the history of his people repeating itself in the future. Orson Hyde prophesied in 1854 that the angel Moroni was the prince of America and that the Constitution and liberty would not be restored until the blood of martyrs had been atoned for. What are the implications for us today? The angel Moroni presides over the destinies of America and fills a lively interest in all our doings. He was in the camp of Washington and by an invisible hand led our fathers to con conquest and victory. This same angel was with Columbus and gave him deep impressions by dreams and visions respecting this new world. The angel of God helped him, was with him on the stormy deep, calmed the troubled elements, and guided his frail vessel to the desired haven. Under the guardianship of this same angel or Prince of America have the United States grown, increased, and flourished. But since the prophets have been slain, the saints persecuted, despoiled of their goods, vanished from their homes, and no earthly arm to interpose for their rescue, what will be the future destiny of this highly favored country? The guardian angel of these United States fly to a remote distance from their borders, and the anger of the Almighty wax hot against them and causing them to drink from the bitter cups 
from the cup of bitterness and division and the very dregs stirred up by the hands of foreign powers in a manner more cruel and fierce than the enemies of the saints in the day of their greatest distress and anguish. And all this because they laid not their heart the martyrdom of the saints and prophets. And all this because they laid not to heart the martyrdom of the saints and prophets. When justice is satisfied and the blood of martyrs atoned for, the guardian angel of America will return to his station, resume his charge, and restore the constitution of our country to the respect and veneration of the people. End of his quote. I've always wondered why the Book of Mormon or why Moroni visited Joseph Smith instead of Mormon, since Mormon abridged most of the plates and wrote most of what we now call the Book of Mormon. Well, now you've just read why Moroni is the one who visited Joseph Smith. He is the angel over America. He is in charge and the guardian of America. Thus, it was proper for him to visit Joseph Smith and to reveal the gold plates. Chapter 8, verse 8, It is the hand of the Lord which hath done it. Moroni recognizes and here points out that the demise of the Nephite nation is directly tied to their sin against light, their personal and national apostasy. They had offended their God to the point at which his mercy was withdrawn. They have now reaped the whirlwind of his wrath. Thus they are at war one with another, causing a continual round of murder and bloodshed. Thus are the consequences, brothers and sisters, of disobedience and willful rebellion. Chapter 8, verse 12. Those who receive this record and shall not condemn it because of the imperfections which are in it, the same shall know of greater things than these. Those who exercise their faith and thereby enjoy the gift of belief, who open themselves to the word and will of the Lord, reveal to them to the point, to that point, prepare themselves for even greater revelation. Those who, for example, read and search and study the Book of Mormon, who pray and ponder upon the upon and teach us timely lessons will one day be privileged to receive even greater revelation and truths. Chapter 8, verse 12, Were it possible, I would make all things known unto you. Moroni was a prophet. He had read the account of the brother of Jared about the marvelous scenes the Savior had shown him, even the end from the beginning, which is contained in the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. It would seem, however, that he was under the same charge and restriction as his father in regard to making those things known. Chapter 8, verse 14. The plates thereof are of no worth because of the commandments of the Lord, for he truly saith that not one shall have them to get gain. In regard to the things of this mortal sphere as measured in terms of dollars, cents, or sinnings, the plates of the Book of Mormon are of little worth. But in regard to eternal things as pertaining to God and his plan for the salvation of mankind, the message of the Book of Mormon is vital and indispensable and thus priceless and thus priceless matter. Today, a person's salvation itself is at stake in whether he accepts or rejects that message. Chapter 8, verse 15. No one can have power to bring it to light, save it be given him of God. As Ammon pointed out to King Lemhi, I can assuredly tell you, O king, of a man that can translate the Jaredite records, for he has with, wherewith that he can look and translate all records that are of ancient date, and it is a gift from God. And the things are called interpreters, and no man can look into them except he be commanded, lest he should look to that he ought not, and he should perish. And whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called a sphere. Joseph Smith was one of God's chosen to use such interpreters. Chapter 8, verse 16. Blessed be he that shall bring this thing to light. Moroni 8, 16 refers to the prophet Joseph Smith who was chosen to bring the Book of Mormon to the world. Many of the ancient prophets were aware of Joseph Smith and prayed for his success to translate and publish the gold plates, thus fulfilling the purposes of God. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of the role that Joseph Smith played in the bringing forth of the Book of Mormon. Quote, the truth is simply that he was a prophet of God, nothing more, not one whit less. The scriptures did not come so much from Joseph as they did through him. 
He was a conduit through which the revelations were given. The prophet Joseph Smith was an unschooled farm boy. To read some of his early letters in the original shows him to be somewhat unpolished in spelling and grammar and expression. That the revelations came through him in any form of literary refinement is nothing short of a miracle. End of quote. I believe it was Emma who said that Joseph could not write a well-worded sentence. That's how illiterate he was. He had only about a third grade education, and that was from within his home. Chapter 816, It shall be brought out of darkness unto light. This is meant both literally and figuratively, as Moroni says, it, the Book of Mormon, shall be brought out of the earth. In another sense, the gold plates came forth from a day of darkness, Nephi and the Lamanite apostasy, to a day of darkness, the continued apostasy of the 19th century. But the Book of Mormon would be one of the means by which light would begin to shine, bring brightly among a people who had been wandering in sin and darkness. It would help to prepare for an eventual day of glorious light, the millennium. Chapter 8, verse 17, Least he shall be in danger of hellfire. That is, let that person who criticizes or condemns the Book of Mormon be fully aware that he thereby condemns that which God approves and sanctions. By so doing, he brings himself under God's condemnation. Chapter 8, verses 19 through 20. Judgment is mine. Elder Down H. Oaks of the Corner of the Twelve Apostles commented on the phrase, Judgment is mine, saith the Lord. Quote, I speak of the final judgment, that is, that future occasion which all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, to be judged according to our works. I believe that the scriptural command to judge not refers most clearly to this final judgment, as in the Book of Mormon declaration that man shall not judge, for judgment is mine, saith the Lord. End of quote. Chapter 8, verses 21 through 22. Who is man to suppose that can lie? Who is man to suppose that lie can prevent God from blessing and endowing with knowledge the covenant people? How narrowly minded must one be to suppose that he or she can prevent the Lord Omnipotent from bringing to pass these eternal purposes, particularly in regard to his fellow followers? The works and the designs and the purposes of God cannot be frustrated, neither can they come to naught. For the Lord God, God doth not walk in crooked paths, neither doth he turn to the right hand, nor to the left hand. I'm sorry, that should be hand, not band. Or to the left, neither doth he vary from that which he hath said. Therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. Remember, remember, that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. Eight twenty three. Search the prophecies of Isaiah. See also Second Nephi eleven two through three, third Nephi twenty eleven, third Nephi twenty three one. Specifically, Moroni is asking his readers to search Isaiah to discover or have reaffirmed the eternal decree that the Holy One of Israel can never forget his people Israel or the covenants he has made with them. Chapter 825, their prayers were also on behalf of him that the Lord should suffer to bring these things forth. The ancients prayed for Joseph Smith. They knew of him. They were aware of his noble and vital mission of the earth. They looked to the time of the coming of the choice seer of the Lord, the day when his servants of the Lord would be instruments in bringing forth the great marvelous work of the last days. So great was his assigned mission with reference to the restitution of all things. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, quote, That holy prophet spoke of him by name thousands of years before his mortal birth, and as to the mighty work to be Started by him, there are as many prophecies foretelling it as there are about any other single subject, not even accepting the host of prophetic utterances about our Lord and his redemptive sacrifice. End of quote. Chapter 8, 27. The blood of the saints shall cry unto the Lord. Too many noble and great ones have lived and preached and taught. Too many have sacrificed their comforts, their homes, their families, and their own lives. Too many have laid their all on the altar. Too many have given their lives to the kingdom of God, for the wicked and unbelieving, to defile the earth. 
who with impunity can defile that which the Almighty God has made. God will not be mocked, nor will his plan for salvation of men and the celestialization of this earth be foiled by those with carnal cares and diabolical desires. Truth will prevail. Righteousness will reign. The cry of the blood of the saints and the prophets from all ages descend to the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth for justice to be rendered, for wrongs to be righted, and for evil to be abolished. Chapter 8, verse 28, even to the envying of them who belong to their churches. That is, the restoration, and specifically the Book of Mormon, shall come to pass in the day when church ministers and teachers shall be envious of the money and prestige and position of their congregants, and when many professing divine call and thus divine authority will function with impure hearts and impure motives. Chapter 8, verse 29 through 30. The days of restoration, that period between the opening of the heavens and the millennial era, would be a time of war among the nations, a time of hatred and enmity, as well as a time of natural disaster. It would be a time when the testimony of the Almighty against wickedness should be heard and seen in the form of thunderings, lightnings, tempests, earthquakes, and floods. Chapter 8, 31. Great pollutions upon the face of the earth. Moroni appears to be using the word pollution described in nefarious deeds and ways of the wicked, the same as the apostle Peter did. He writes that this is the context of murders and robbings and lyings and deceivings and whoredoms and all manner of abominations. Those who live in our day see this scenario acted out daily all over the world. They also should have an express an especial appreciation for this warning, for it stands as a little reminder of what happened to the surface of the earth on which we dwell, when men and women are careless and thoughtless about their stewardship to dress and care for the earth and all things which abide on its surface. While serving as a member of the Presidency of the Seventy, Elder Joe J. Christensen suggested that the great pollution, pollutants spoken of were not environmental, but primarily spiritual. We all hear and read a great deal these days about our polluted physical environment, acid rain, smog, toxic waste. But there is another kind of pollution that is much more dangerous and mortal and spiritual. In a recent conference, the boy Care Packer said, as we test the moral environment, we find the pollution index is spiraling upward. The Apostle Paul foresaw that day, foresaw that in the last days perilous times should come. And speaking of the last days, the prophet Moroni declared, Yea, it shall come in a day when there shall be great pollutions upon the face of the earth. Sadly, the effects of this great pollution are perhaps even more evident in the mass media, films, television, and popular music. Of this, Senator Robert D. Byrd said, If we in this nation continue so the images of murder, violence, drug abuse, perversion, and pornography before the eyes of millions of children year after year, day after day, we should not be surprised at the foundation of our society rot away as if from leprosy. End of quote. In most of the mass media, there seems to be a declaration of war against almost everything the majority treasures most, the family, religion, and patriotism. Marriage is degraded while marital and extramarital relations are encouraged and glamorized. Profanity and the foulest of vulgar gutter language bombard the ears of all who listen. Human life itself is trivialized by the constant barrage of violence and killing. 8.33. Why have you transfigured the Holy Word of God? In the church, we normally use the word transfigured to refer to a being lifted up spiritually to a higher plane for a period of time. Here, the word has negative connotations in applying changing the appearance or substance of the scriptures. Chapter 8, 34 through 35. The Lord has shown unto me great and marvelous things concerning that which must shortly come. President Ezra Tapp Benson declared that our study of the Book of Mormon should be influenced by our knowledge that Moroni and I saw our day and wrote with, his, with us in mind, quote, We must make the Book of Mormon a central focus of study because it was written for our day. The Nephites never had the book, neither did the Lamanites of ancient times. It was meant for us. Moroni wrote near the end of the Nephite civilization. Under the inspiration of God, who sees all things from the beginning, he abridged centuries of records, choosing the stories, speeches, and events that would most, which would be most helpful to us. 
Each of the major writers of the Book of Mormon testified that he wrote for future generations. Mormon himself said, Yea, I speak unto you, you remnant of the house of Israel. And Moroni, the last of the inspired writers, actually saw our day and time. If they saw our day and chose those things which would be of greatest worth unto us, is not that how we should study the Book of Mormon? We should constantly ask ourselves, Why did the Lord inspire Mormon or Moroni or Alma to include that in his record? What lesson can I learn from that to help me live in this day and age? And there is example after example of how that great question will be answered. End of quote. Chapter 8, 36 through 39. Moroni sees in vision that pride will have affected the people of the last days and thereby entered the churches. Even in the Church of Jesus Christ the Latter-day Saints will pride be an issue where members are more concerned with what they wear, costly apparel, than paying tithing and a generous fast offering and seek the praise of the world. Like the great and abominable church of old which persecuted the saints, reveled in immorality and immodesty and thus defiled the name of religion, the people of the last days will be similar similarly consumed. This prophecy is a solemn warning, not just to the Christian world in general, but also to the Latter-day Saints, particularly those in the United States. The saints of God need to labor day and night to retain purity of heart and thus, per propri and thus propriety in their dealings with God and with one another. Zion can only be established among people who are pure in heart, a people who search out the poor and needy, who see those in need, and who focus their attention, their loyalties, and their time on people and on things which have eternal relevance and worth. We now go to Moroni chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 2, the day of your visitation, that is, the day when the Lord visits the earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. In another sense, it will be the day of visitation with each of us at the same time of our death, if we do not live to behold in the flesh the great and dreadful day of his coming, as though we had lived to see that coming. Then we shall be either lifted up and quickened by his transforming glory, or suffer with others who have spurned his message and scoffed at his suffering and death. Chapter 9, verse 2, the phrase, The elements shall melt with fervent heat. See 3 Nephi 26, 3 and DNC 101, 25. The glory of the Lord, when he comes to all the world, will be such that only that should be. will be such that only those who are of terrestrial or celestial nature would be able to abide his coming and thereby be capable of remaining on the millennium terrestrialized earth, the millennial or terrestrialized earth. The bodies of those who are telestial or lower will be consumed in the fires of his glory and their spirits sent immediately to hell in the spirit world. There they will remain until the time of the second resurrection at the end of the millennium. President Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, Now when Christ comes, we will get a new heaven and a new earth, and all of these corruptible things will be removed. They will be consumed by fire. And somebody said, Brother Smith, do you mean it to say that it's going to be literal fire? I said, Oh no, it will not be literal fire any more than it was literal water that covered the earth in the flood. I hope you catch the sarcasm. Just as it was literal water at the flood, there will be literal fire at the second coming. Chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. Do you suppose that you could be happy to dwell with that whole being when your souls are racked with a consciousness of guilt that ye have ever abused his laws? President Joseph Fielding Smith explained why the unrepentant will be miserable in the presence of Jesus Christ. Quote, there can be no salvation without repentance. A man cannot enter into the kingdom of God in his sins. It would be a very inconsistent thing for a man to come into the presence of the Father and to dwell in God's presence in his sins. I think there are a great many people upon the earth, many of them perhaps in the church, at least some in the church, who have an idea that they can go through this life doing as they please, violating the commandments of the Lord, and yet eventually they are going to come into his presence. They think they are going to repent, perhaps in the spirit world. They ought to read the words of Moroni. Do you suppose that ye shall dwell with him, Christ, under a consciousness of your guilt? Do you suppose that you could be happy to dwell with that holy being when your whole souls are racked with a consciousness of guilt that you have ever abused his laws? 
To dwell with God, if one were unworthy and thus incapable of doing so, would be to be, sub to be subject not to the blessings of heaven, but rather to the cursings of hell. In that day, when all pretense and sham will have been removed, when facade and appearance will have been stripped away, when we shall see as we are seen, unknown as we are known, in that day we shall be pleased to dwell with those whose lives were like our own. Those who on earth sneered at righteousness will then find no comfort in a place of righteousness. Those whose hearts yearn for the things of the Spirit will then receive the same, even a fullness. President Spencer W. Kimball explained why one who has sinned feels the burden of guilt and the need for repentance. Quote, As repentance gets underway, there must be a deep consciousness of guilt, and in the consciousness of guilt may come suffering to the mind, the spirit, and sometimes even to the body. In order to live with themselves, people who transgress must follow one or two or must follow one or the other of two alternatives. The one is to sneer to shear their conscience or dull their sensitivity with mental tranquilizers so that their transgressions may be continued. Those who choose this alternative eventually become calloused and lose their desire to repent. The other alternative is to, is to permit remorse to lead one to total sorrow, then to repentance, and finally, on to eventual forgiveness. Remember this, that forgiveness can never come without repentance, and repentance can never come until one has bared his soul, admitted his actions without excuse or rationalizations. He must admit to himself that he has sinned without the slightest minimization of the offense or rationalization, rationalizing of its seriousness, or without soft peddling its gravity. He must admit that his sin is as big as it it, at it as it really is, and not call a pound and not call a pound an ounce. Those persons who choose to meet the issue and transform their lives may find repentance the harder road at first, but they will find it the infinitely more desirable path as they taste of its fruits. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 7 through 9. I speak unto you who deny the revelations of God. Whosoever rejects the revelations and gifts of God, the miracles and signs and wonders, does so in either absolute ignorance of the Holy Scriptures or in absolute rebellion and defiance against the order of the things in the Lord's kingdom. If there is a God and if he, possess, if he is a possessor of all knowledge and all power, and if we are his children, then it is inconceivable that he would not want to reveal himself and manifest his power among his offspring. If such things are no more, if they have in some way been done away, then it is because of the lack of faith on the part of those on earth. And Lord Allen H. Oaks explained the connection between scriptures and personal revelation. Quote, what makes Latter-day Saints different from most other Christians in the way we read and use the Bible and other scriptures is our belief in continual revelation. For us, the scriptures are not the ultimate source of knowledge, but what precedes the ultimate source. The ultimate knowledge comes by revelation. With Moroni, we affirm that he who denieth revelation knoweth not the gospel of Christ. The word of the Lord in the scriptures is like a lamp to guide our feet, and revelation is like a mighty force that increases the land's illumination many fold. We encourage everyone to make careful study of the scriptures and of the prophetic teachings concerning them, and to prayerfully seek personal revelation and to know their meaning for themselves. Chapter 9, verses 9 through 10, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Moroni declared that God is an unchangeable being who will remain the same yesterday and forever. Modern revelation confirms that the coming forth of the Book of Mormon proves God continues to inspire men and call them to his holy work in our day as he did in the past, showing that he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. In the Lectures on Faith state that in order to have perfect faith in Christ, one must have a correct idea of God's character, perfections, and attributes. One of God's characters is that he will not change. God changes not, neither, neither is there variableness with him, but that he is the same from everlasting to everlasting, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round without variation. Consider the blessings of knowing that God continues his holy work in our day and will also remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can have full confidence in God. Moroni warned us that there are those who have imagined a God who doth vary, 
of Nile Max when the corner of the Twelve Apostles taught that we could not believe or trust in a God who changes or who is still learning new truths. Quote, the omniscience of God in the mind of some of well-meaning Latter-day Saints has been qualified by the concept of eternal progression. Some have wrongly assumed God's pro progress is related to his acquisition of additional knowledge. God derives his great and continuing joy and glory by increasing and advancing his creations and not from new intellectual experiences. There is a vast difference, therefore, between an omniscient God and a false notion that God is on some sort of post-doctoral fellowship, still researching for additional key truths and vital data. Were the latter so, God might at any moment discover something new, truth not previously known to him that would restructure, diminish, or undercut certain truths previously known by him. Prophecy would be mere prediction, planning assumptions pertaining to our redemption would need to be revised. Fortunately for us, however, his plan of salvation is constantly underway, not constantly under revision. Christ and Father are all knowing. They are not progressing in knowledge. They're progressing in glories and kingdoms. Chapter 9, verse 11 through 26, I will show unto you a God of miracles. Note the evidence Moroni gave that bears witness to the miracles of God, the creation of the heavens and earth, the creation of man, and the spiritual testimonies of the miracles of Jesus and the apostles. The God of miracles described by Moroni can be f still be found. Elder Downlake Jokes bore witness that many mighty that many miracles happened in our day and are present in the true church of Jesus Christ. Quote, Many miracles happen in our day in the work of our church and the lives of our members. Members, many of you have witnessed miracles, perhaps more than you realize. A miracle has been defined as a beneficial event brought about through divine power that mortals do not understand and of themselves cannot duplicate. The idea that events are brought about through divine power is rejected by most irreligious people and even by some who are religious. Miracles worked by the power of the priesthood are always present in the true church of Jesus Christ. The Duke of Mormon teaches that God has provided a means that man, through faith, might work mighty miracles. The means provided is priesthood power, and that power works miracles through faith. End of quote. Elder Bruce R. McConkie spoke of why miracles sometimes cease. Quote, why do signs and miracles cease in certain ages? Why are they not found at all times among all peoples? Were those of old entitled to great blessings and those of us who are now dwell on the earth, the same earth that uh, once was theirs? Moroni answers the reason why a God of gifts and miracles ceases to do miracles among the children of men and to pour out his gifts upon them is because that they dwindle in unbelief and depart from the right way and know not the God in whom they should trust. They worship false gods whom they define in their creeds, and they no longer walk in the same path pursued by the saints of former days. It is men who have changed, not God. He is the same everlastingly. All men who have the same faith and live the same law will reap the same blessings. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 13. This is wherein all men are redeemed. There is, in other words, in a sense in which all people, saints and sons of perdition alike, are redeemed from death. All who have taken a physical body shall be raised in the resurrection, shall stand before the God to be judged of their works. They thereby are redeemed from spiritual death, the separation of the sinner from the Holy One. Chapter 9, 13, A Redemption from an Endless Sleep the spirit body is eternal and cannot die, even if there had been no resurrection from the dead, in which case, as Jacob reminds us, all would have become devils and angels to the devil. Even then, the spirits of men and women, so far as we now know, would have forever remained alive. Moroni seems to be speaking here in the figurative language. There is no sleep at the time of death, nor would the spirits of mankind have remained literally in an endless sleep. Had there been no atoning sacrifice and no, thus no resurrection from the dead, the physical body would have slept, that is, remained in the grave. This is the same sense as that in which Paul speaks of Jesus becoming the first fruits of them that slept, that is, the first to overcome death and come forth from the grave. Chapter 9.13, All Stand Before His Bar. 
The reality is that there will be a whole hierarchy of judges who under Christ shall judge the righteous. He, Christ alone, shall issue the decrees of damnation to the wicked. Chapter 9, verse 19, he would cease to be God. As we have shown previously, God cannot cease to be God. It is utterly and absolutely impossible for him to do so. And Moroni knows this. He is arguing towards the absurd, towards the impossible, to, her, to make his point. It is though Moroni were saying, it is as ridiculous to suppose that revelation and signs and miracles have ceased as it is to suppose that God would cease to be God. 29, chapter 9, verse 21. Whoso believe in Christ, doubting nothing whatsoever, shall he shall ask the Father in the name of Christ, it shall be granted him. Moroni gives three keys to receiving answers to our prayers. First, one must believe in Christ, meaning they must do all that Christ requires of them. Second, doubting nothing, which is to have complete trust and faith in Christ. And third, you must ask the Father in the name of Christ. This is more than just saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The Bible Dictionary tells us what it means to ask in the name of Christ. Quote, we pray in Christ's name when our mind is the mind of Christ and our wishes the wishes of Christ, when his words abide in us. We then ask for things that it is possible for God to grant. Many prayers remain unanswered because they are not in Christ's name at all. They in no way represent his mind, but spring out of the selfishness of man's heart. You may ask, well, how do I speak by the mind of Christ? And how do I pray with the mind of Christ? Well, you have the Holy Ghost tell you what to say in your prayers. That would give you the mind of Christ. So speak, so praying in the name of Christ is praying by having the Holy Ghost tell you what to say, and then you repeat those words in your prayers. Chapter 9, verse 27, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling before him. In the truest sense, we cannot work out our own salvation. We cannot save ourselves any more than we can create ourselves. Creation and redemption are the works of God. They are not within our mortal domain. The works we perform, receiving the ordinance of salvation, operating and functioning in the church and kingdom, performing deeds of service and acts of Christian kindness, in the ultimate sense, cannot save us. They are necessary but insufficient. On the other hand, when we have been changed and renewed through the Holy Ghost, when our hearts have been made through the merits and mercy of the Lord, remade through the merits and mercy of the Lord and Savior, then the works of righteousness flow from a regenerate soul. Our works are then his works. They are motivated and empowered by him. The Apostle Paul wrote, Wherefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And now note how and from whence such work arises. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Chapter 928, Ask not that you may not that you may consume it on your lust. That is, we are to be cautious in regard to what we pray for. If we seek for and cultivate the spirit of inspiration, our prayers will be directed and guided thereby, and we will find ourselves asking only for those things which the Lord would desire to grant us. James explained that often our prayers are not answered because we pray after the wrong things. Chapter 9, verse 29, See that you do all things in worthiness. This is Moroni's plea that the saints of God perform the ordinance of salvation in worthiness in order that the powers of God channeled to us through these ordinances may be fully and completely received. In fact, we are instructed to do all such things in the name of Jesus Christ. Chapter 9, 32-34, Moroni wrote in Reformed Egyptian. Moroni stated that he had the ability to write at least two languages, Hebrew and Egyptian. He noted that if the plates had been sufficiently large, he would have written in Hebrew. However, those who kept the record used Reformed Egyptian due to the lack of space. Previously in the Book of Mormon, both Nephi and King Benjamin acknowledged their use of Egyptian. Nephi stated that he wrote in the language of the Egyptians when he engraved the small plates. When speaking to his sons about the importance of the brass plates, King Benjamin noted that Lehi could read the record because he had been taught in the language of the Egyptians. Therefore, we understand that Lehi taught the gospel and Egyptian to his children, that thereby they could teach them to their children. Eventually, this pattern continued through the generations of record keepers that followed until Moroni learned the language from his father. 
However, Morales' statement that he wrote in Reformed Egyptian indicates that some adaptations in the use of the language had occurred over the thousand years from the time of Lehi. This could explain why Moroni concluded with the comment that none other people knoweth our language, but that God had prepared means for the eventual interpretation and translation of the record. Third, that probably should be chapter 9, verse 34. But the Lord knoweth the things which we have written. It is as if Moroni catches himself, realizing that it was unnecessary to fret over the particularity of the Nephite language and admits that all this really does not matter very much anyway. God has provided a means to the Urim and Thummim by the power of the Holy Ghost that the sacred volume known as the Book of Mormon will be translated. Indeed, the only true translation of a sacred record is attained by sacred means, by the gift and power of God. Elder James E. Talmadge at the corner of the Twelve wrote, quote, There will be and there can be no absolute reliable translation of Scripture unless it is lest it be affected through the gift of translation as one of the endowments of the Holy Ghost. The translator must have the spirit of the prophet if he would render in any other tongue the prophet's words, and human wisdom alone leads not to that possession. End of quote. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped with some of the doctrines or principles in this chapter, and if it did, please hit the like button.